there's some good craziness going on because they looked at each other and they decided we know that in, in the world as it has been, it might not be possible for us to get together and have a chat. But something's stirring across the country because of what happened in Selma, Alabama, because some folks are willing to march across a bridge. And so they got together and Barack Obama Jr. was born. Well, that's a great story, but none of it is true. See, the problem with that one is that Barack Obama Jr. was born four years before the march on Selma took place. How's well, that work? Tell me I don't have a claim on Selma, Alabama. No. Don't tell me I'm not coming home when I come to Selma, Alabama. Could, I'm you... here because somebody marched. No, no, you're not. You don't have a claim. You're not here because they marched. You were born before they marched. You were born in 1961, and the Selma March was 1965. So, Mr. President, where are you getting this story? You are not coming home when you come to Selma, Alabama. Now, during his coming out speech, if you will, I mean, not to be confused with last night's coming out speech, this is the one where he burst in the national spotlight at the DNC convention in 2004. We were told that he was a young, moderate uniter, a fresh, post-racial, post-partisan politician. And boy, his speech really sounded like that. I remember it. It was great. This is how he began his speech. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. He grew up herding goats, went to school in a tin roof shack. His father, my grandfather, was a cook, a domestic servant to the British. Okay. Now, according to Barack Obama Sr.'s first wife, Kezia, that's not true. It's not true. According to his father's wife, not true. Barack Sr. married Kezia when, she was, uh, eight, when he was 18 and she was 16. Her parents were upset and wanted her to come back home. So, Senior's father, his grandfather, gave Kezia's family 14 cows as a dowry. Wait a minute, I just, he had a tin roof and he, he was a servant with the British master. How many servants of the British masters have 14 cows in which to buy their son's wife? <laughs> My father was a baker. He didn't have any cows or wouldn't have that kind of money to buy my wife. But Barack continued. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. The love his parents shared is improbable. That much is absolutely true. Considering that Barack Sr. was still married to the aforementioned Kenyan woman named, named Kezia who had two children with him. So it was improbable. So his dad comes over while still married and two children over there. He comes over here. That's where he meets Barack's mother, Stanley Ann Dunham. Uh, Barack and uh, Dunham n never even shared the same residence. Not to mention the fact that one week after Barack was born, Barack's mom, Ann Dunham, took Barack away and left Hawaii to enroll at the University of Washington in Seattle, leaving Sr. behind. By the time she came back to Hawaii, Barack Sr. was already long gone, for good. First off to school in Boston, and then Harvard, and then he met somebody in Harvard. He married yet a third woman named Ruth. And he took Ruth back to Kenya with him where his first wife, whom he was still married to, waited. So he had three wives. So that, yes, I would agree that, I mean, he didn't really get into the details there, but yes, improbable love is probably a good word for it. But as far as his parents' abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation, this is where it really gets dicey. Anne lived much of her life in Indonesia and Pakistan and anywhere else but America. Barack Sr. got his free first-class education in Hawaii and then at Ivy League's Harvard and then hightailed it back to Kenya, never to return to America. Other than a month-long visit to Hawaii when Barack Obama was 10, that was it. He accepted the priceless American education and then used it to benefit himself in Kenya. 
But how did he use it? To promote American ideals that he loved? No, he used it to promote his brand of socialism and communism in his homeland's government. At his star-making speech in uh, 2004, Barack Obama said this. They would give me an African name, Barack, or Blessed, believing that in a tolerant America, your name is no barrier to success. Okay, that's great. That's the kind of thing that we all said, wow, that is great. This is a storybook. Exactly. It's interesting, because he went by the name Barry for most of his childhood, except for the exact opposite reason. Obama says his mother advised him not to switch from being called Barry to Barack for her fear that his African name would mean something very, very bad for him in America. So they didn't name him Barack because they had great love for America and respect, and they knew. No, when he tried to change it later when he was becoming a radical, she said, don't. You can't trust America. So which was it? Obama's highly acclaimed book, Dreams From My Father, details his struggles, such as that one and other racial tensions causing him confusion about his place in the world. It set the tone for the post-racial uh, excitement his legions of followers felt. In the book, he told the heartbreaking story of visiting his mother one day at work at the U.S. Embassy when the family had moved with his stepfather to Indonesia. He had leafed through a copy of Life magazine, and he found a horrible, shocking photo, one that he would never forget, and an article about a black man who was so uncomfortable with the color of his skin that he bleached his skin in effort to become white. It was shocking. It was a rude awakening for little Barack at the time. Unfortunately, it's not true. When Life was contacted for the details of that story, Life said, we've looked it up, we've never, we've never run that story in this magazine. Obama's people said, well, then it was ebony. And then it was, well, uh, who knows what it was? That was Barack's reply to the anomaly. By the way, ebony also was contacted. They never had run that story either. Who knows what it was? I do. It was fiction. Another unnerving racial story in Obama's brilliant and moving autobiography that showcased the racial division that he had overcome was the story of his white girlfriend in New York, whose name we now know to be uh, Genevieve. After, after moving there to attend Columbia, one particular night, um, he took her out to see a black playwright in the city. Well, this is another very moving part of the book. Barack found the play extremely funny, but she came out confused. Here's his description of that fateful night in the book, he says, after the play was over, my friend started talking about black people, why they were so angry all the time. I said it was a matter of remembering. Nobody asked the Jews why the Jews remember the Holocaust, I think I said. And she said, that's different. And I said, it wasn't. And she said, that anger was just a dead end. And we had a big fight right there in front of the theater. When we got back to the car, she started crying. She couldn't be black, she said. She could, uh, she would if she could, but she couldn't. She could only be herself, and that just wasn't enough. When the press recently finally contacted this woman, she said, glad you called. Nothing like that ever happened. Noth nothing like that ever happened. With her, anyway. Oh, yeah, that's right, Barack Obama now admits. The girlfriend he was talking to was a, was a compression. He was using a composite girl when describing his dates in New York. How do you have a compression conversation like that about race? Answer, you don't. It's script writing. This uniter, this post-racial icon of hope and change. Oh, he did stir the racial stew, though, to the point to where even he, he threw his beloved grandmother, who raised him when his mom left him, she, he threw her under the racial bus. Look at this and watch his eyes. He's talking about Jeremiah Wright here, defending Jeremiah Wright, but watch. He's reading the teleprompter in something so personal about his grandmother. 
I can no more disown him than I can disown my white grandmother, a woman who helped raise me, a woman who sacrificed again and again for me, a woman who loves me as much as she loves anything in this world, but a woman who once confessed her fear of black men who passed her by on the street. No way. And who on more than one occasion has uttered racial or ethnic stereotypes that made me cringe. That's not true. Yeah, I don't know if that happened or not, but this is a storyline. Nobody says that about their grandmother and has to read it. If it's true, you look at the camera in the eye. You don't need to read that. A few days later, he explains this to a radio show. The, uh, the, the point I was making was not that my grandmother uh, harbors uh, any racial animosity. She doesn't. Right. But she is a uh, typical white person who, uh, you know, if she sees somebody on the street that she doesn't know, you know, there's a reaction that's been bred into uh, our experiences that, that don't go away and that sometimes uh, come out in, in the wrong way. I have to tell you, man, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking to myself, this is a show that you need to preserve. You need to burn this onto a DVD and preserve this show. Somebody needs to, rem somebody needs to remember all this stuff because this, this will be history someday. Someday all of this truth will come out. No white politician could have ever survived a comment like that, typical kind of any person, with a certain reaction that had been bred into them. That's crazy talk. They'd have no career left, nor should they. And they certainly wouldn't have been elected president of the United States, but Barack Obama would do or say anything to become president. And his script writers and his minions in the media helped him do it all away. He could look at the American people directly in the eye through a teleprompter and flat out lie over and over again, as he did in the debates with John McCain, as he did on one of the rare occasions when McCain brought up his seedy relationship with terrorist Bill Ayers. So, uh, and you launched your political campaign in Mr. Ayers' living room. That's absolutely not and, true. Uh, and the facts are facts, and records are and records. Not the it's not true? Yes, it is. It's an amazing work of fiction that you just watched. It's not true. It's one that even the left-leaning factcheck.org verifies. While trying to cover and excuse Obama over silly details of the relationship with heirs, and for that matter, even covering desperately for heirs, they said referring to him as a terrorist is a stretch. Fact check specifically mentions at least half a dozen heirs meetings that Obama lied about or covered up, including board meetings, retreats, news conferences together. Oh, and yes, in fact, heirs hosted a meet and greet coffee for Obama, who was running for state senate and who lived three blocks away from him. That's from the left. Yes in Bill Ayers' living room, and he lied. Why? You know what's interesting is the, the part of Obama's script or novel or fairy tale life that have been left out is Bill Ayers' father, Bill Ayers' dad, Tom, gave Obama his first professional break. Bill Ayers' dad was a mentor to Barack, but they never met. I'm just now beginning to understand what Bill Clinton meant when he said, it's a fairy tale. And he's not talking about a black man becoming president. It's that this man's life is a fairy tale. It's a fable. It's made up stories. You might remember that Obama went back and forth incessantly about his Marxist spiritual advisor, Jeremiah Wright. I did not hear such incendiary language uh, it, myself personally, uh, either in conversations with him or when I was in the pew, did I ever hear him make remarks that could be considered controversial while I sat in the church? Yes. Okay. All of that and so much more was before he even got to the White House.